Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for your patience. I'm Jim Olson, Assistant Executive Director of the NTCA. And again, thank you for attending today's webinar. The webinar today is titled, Movement Joints in Tile and Stone Installation. This presentation will discuss identifying and specifying the proper treatment of movement joints in tile and stone installations. Our sponsors for this presentation is MAPEI. Before we begin, I must take care of a little business. Today's webinar will be muted. Please use the participant feedback or chat screen on your computer to ask questions. Type them in. We will answer your questions at the end of this presentation. All of our webinars are archived and available to watch at any time after the webinars are presented. Please email your request to me. Once we begin, I will provide my email address on the chat screen. If the audio on your computer is poor, call the number on the chat screen to listen on your phone. Today's speaker, Mike Daniels, Technical Service Manager, Mapei Marine, has 28 years of experience at Mapei Corporation and a total of 35 years of experience in the construction industry. This experience includes technical assistance and product training for the U.S., Caribbean, South America, and marine markets, small and large-scale physical structure testing of building systems, the construction of building assemblies, product formulation, and quality control. He is currently responsible for responsible for on-site product support, product recommendations, and performing product training on the installation of underlayments and flooring systems related to marine applications, as well as the evaluation of new products or systems in development. Mike is an active ASTM FO6 and C21 committee member. Welcome, Mike. Well, thank you very much, uh, and uh, I want to welcome all the participants to this presentation on movement joints of, uh, for to uh, and joints and tile installation. Now, again, we're going to talk a little bit about the specifying and treatment of these joints and try to cover as many subjects as we can. So let's get to it. I wanted to remind you that uh, MAPE is a active actively involved with the American Institute of Architects, and this presentation is registered through their continuing education system. I want to begin by sharing some words of wisdom from a, uh, someone who means a lot to me, someone I have loved to read about, uh, Abraham Lincoln, and he said, you cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. These are great words to remember when we design an installation. It's also great words for life, but in respect to installation, they're great words to remember. In our discussion today, I want to cover four distinct topics. One, what's the risk to tiling, tile installation or occupants when we don't incorporate room for movement? Two, what types of joints can be present in a concrete floor? What design function do they serve? Three, what types of movement are possible in a tile installation? And four, what industry guidelines apply and how do you incorporate these into your specification and design? Without further ado, I'm going to start talking a little bit about what happens when we don't. If you look at these photos here, you'll see two specific jobs and both of them are in pretty mild climates. And you'll notice the tiles are tented up. And this is something that a lot of us may have received phone calls or we may have walked in on this type of situation or seen it somewhere and we go, hmm, so what was the problem here? Was it the tile? Was it the adhesive? Did the grout do something? What happened anyway? These are just examples of something that we commonly know in the industry that happens when no room for movement is allowed in the installation. Another example comes here. Now, again, this is risk to, to people and, and things around the building. This building was actually installed with 20-inch by 36-inch porcelain tiles. Now, if you notice, 
it looks like it's three stories. It's actually a four-story building. Now, the issues were that the tiles were falling off the face of the building. Now, I, I can't imagine any of you would think about something like a 20-pound tile falling from four stories high on top of someone. That would be a terrible thing. But this was an installation issue, no expansion joints, and there were some issues with coverage that were involved. Another example here is shown where we had a glass tile shower. They put no movement joints at the edges of the installation. And you can see that the tiles are cracked all over the place. Now, one of the things I want to remind you is with glass tiles, they move a lot more than regular tiles. So I want you to imagine what could happen if someone were taking a shower in here and this tile were to break and a piece of that or a shard of that glass were to come off onto someone showering in there. That would not be a pleasant experience. Another example here is actually in a swimming pool where people think, well, you know, the temperatures are pretty consistent. We really shouldn't have any issues, and the tiles are pretty stable. I mean, they're porcelain tiles. They shouldn't really move that much. But if you look in the lower left corner, you'll see that there's quite a bit of tenting of the tiles. Now, you're kind of asking yourself, did the tile expand? Did the grout expand? What happened here? Well, we know that any structure is dynamically moving. So really, if we would have put movement room in this installation, we probably would have never seen this happen. If you notice in the upper right-hand corner, we actually scraped the grout out to show that the joint's gone. You, you cannot put grout in there. There's no room for grout. And that's why the tiles are heaving up, because the difference between the tile and the surface were great enough to cause the bond to break between the two surfaces. The next example that I'm going to show you here is actually three different examples of installations, but the funny thing here is it's three different types of tiles all exhibiting the same problem. It's because some people say, well, you know, I had porcelain tile and that's why I had the problem, or I installed natural stone, in this case granite, and that's why I had the problem, or I installed ceramic tile and I had the problem. But if you notice, these are three different types of tile. So really, it doesn't appear as though the tile is the problem. We've seen the conditions really didn't lead to much. You can see the coverage was adequate here. So really, we're left to really know that when these tiles start tenting, they create a tripping hazard, a breakage of tiles. Now the next one, this one actually popped up during operation. So people were in a shopping mall, and these tiles heaved up while they were walking around in the mall. Now, can you imagine this happening with this, the noise going on? People evacuated the shopping center because they were afraid something much more serious was happening. I'm, what I'm getting to at this point is that no matter what, we see that this happens in installations all over the place. Now, if you're wondering about where this one is, this one was actually in Australia. So it's not just exclusively the U.S. I've seen it in the Caribbean. I've seen it in South America, Central America. I've seen it all over the world. This is not a U.S. specific issue. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is types of joints. Now, in our substrates, we're going to have certain types of joints of, that are going to be present in concrete. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that and what the ACI CT18 standard tells us about these joints and how they're designed. What you notice is that all move, movement is possible in all substrates. The differing joint types are suggested by the ACI guidelines in concrete placement. And each one of the joints is going to have a specific purpose. So let's take a look. The first one is a contraction joint. A lot of people call these cut joints form joints, whatever you want to call them, the joint is essentially designed to create a weakened plane in the concrete. Now the purpose of this is that when we pour the concrete, I'm sure you've heard the expression that 
the difference between uh, cracked concrete and uncracked concrete is that the uncracked one's going to crack. The truth of the matter is concrete shrinks when it cures. What the cut joint does is it forces that shrinkage to happen at that joint because we're creating a weak spot in the concrete, kind of like what we do when we cut a tile. The next type of joint that we're going to discuss here is a construction joint. Now, if you'll notice the diagrams to the right side, you'll notice that these can be a, they can be a butt joint, they can be a couple different types of form joints, they can have reinforcement through them or not. The real reason why we place them is it has a design feature. The concrete engineer is putting it there for a reason and he's tying the two surfaces together. Now, the most common one I've seen, and I see it all the time, is you're, you see the road construction and you see these guys drilling holes in the side of the slabs and putting these pins in. That's a construction joint between slabs of road surface. We also use them in structural elements as well. Now, the next one is probably not such a pretty picture, but you'll notice there's cracks all over this floor. This is a cold joint. And what happened here is that someone poured a slab, they stopped, and then while that, that slab actually cured, they came back and poured another one next to it after it had cured and hardened. The challenge here is that each one of them isn't bonded to the other. So the movement that happens due to shrinkage, expansion, contraction is not really controlled. And you can see in this picture that there's some issues with that slab. It's got a lot of cracks in it. The next joint that is specifically used in concrete is the expansion joint. This is the one, as we started out with the cut joint, people think that's an expansion joint. This is truly the expansion joint. What an expansion joint is in an engineering sense is it's a point of discontinuity or separation between two concrete slabs. And this allows for movement to occur. And typically it's designed amount of movement the engineer or the architect involved in the construction of this surface will actually know how much movement they need to compensate based on the design of the concrete, the design of the structure, and the elements or the environment where it will be exposed. And if you notice in this photograph, I'm actually, I'm, in this slide, I'm showing three different types of joint. One of them is a sliding joint, which is the upper left-hand corner. This is the one that they, you typically are going to see in an airport, you're going to see it in a mall, you're going to see it in offices where they've got a lot of heavy rolling traffic over the floor. And it's designed to structurally support what's being rolled over that joint without failing. The other two joints are typical in installations where there's a little bit less heavy traffic, but we still need that joint. You have the preform joint, which is the upper right corner, and then you have the caulk joint, which is the lower right corner. And that caulk joint is filled with some different types of sealant. So we're going to get to that soon. Now, the, another type of joint is called an isolation joint. If you look in the diagram, you'll notice that an isolation joint is actually a separation between fixation sections of concrete. Now, what it's designed to do is it's designed to let these two surfaces act independently of each other. The reason this is necessary is that if you'll notice, we've got a pier, we've got a foundation wall with a foundation footing, and then we have a slab that's floating around these things. Now, each one of them is going to deal with a little bit different level of support. So the pier is designed to have more support than the footing. The footing has more support than the slab. Each one of them could move differently than the other. The idea is we know that there's going to be movement at those spots, and we're trying to isolate those two areas so that we don't cause issues with the slab, which is the weakest section here. The next thing we want to talk about is actually the type of movement possible. Now, if you notice in these diagrams, I've kind of exaggerated it quite a bit, and I've included a line over the top of each one of these movements to help you kind of picture exactly what's going on, you'll notice that you've got the types of movement include bending, which literally is where the slabs bend back and forth, 
up and down. You've got in-plane where they move like a piece of paper sliding across a desktop. Shear, pretty self-explanatory, and curling. Now, each one of them has a specific cause, and we'll get to that next, but I wanted you to kind of picture them in your mind as we, as we move forward and the reason for having a joint over these, having a uh, movement joint over the top of these sections of concrete has a specific purpose and a design intention. So what exactly causes this movement? Probably asking yourself, okay, we've got movement. Well, there's a lot of causes. We've got physical movement in the substrate. We don't really consider it in detail, but did you know that the shrinkage in a concrete can represent 0.01 to 0.03% in dimensional change of the concrete? Doesn't sound like much, does it? But if we take a 100-foot section of concrete, that means that that slab could grow or shrink by 3 eighths of an inch. That's a lot. Now, we can also ha find that the concrete can actually change dimension due to the level of water or moisture within the concrete. Now, this is something we discovered over the years as well as we've learned from studies of moisture issues within concrete and resilient flooring. But the truth of the matter is, is that when there's mo moisture in the slab, what will happen is that the cement paste between the the actual particles of aggregate will actually expand in relation to the level of water that's in there. When they're drier, they shrink back. Now, when we get the curling that we were seeing, that's actually caused by that same effect. In other words, the moisture in the slab causing the concrete paste or the cement paste to expand or contract within the material. However, in this case, the top will actually be drier than the bottom, or the bottom may be drier than the top. What that means is you'll have a differential level of movement. Differential drying means that the surface of the concrete will be a different dimension than the bottom of the concrete, causing the curling to occur. Now, we've probably seen this, and people talk about the movement at the joints, and they say, well, this is curled up, and then they put a, a moisture Media, uh, mitigation membrane on top of it and it lays back down. That's because the moisture goes into equilibrium within the slab. So that's one type of movement. The next type of movement is called thermal coefficient of expansion and contraction. Now what is that? That's essentially a big term for the slab gets bigger when it's hot and gets smaller when it's cold. That's one of the issues. Now, this change in temperature can happen due to seasonal changes. It can happen to solar gain. It can happen to various different things that we can't really control or predict. Another type of movement is actually due to support in the slab. This can be due to washout. It can be due to soil compaction issues. It can be due to different surfaces, an old structure being built next to a new structure and tying those two floors together. That can cause movement out of plane. Another type of movement that we really should consider here in our installations is a little bit, this one's something that even, even I, when I was doing the research here, I discovered this was kind of an interesting phenomenon. Did you know? that with tiles that are over 3% moisture absorption, they actually can grow and shrink based on the amount of moisture in, this, in the actual tile. And the tile will typically be its smallest when it comes out of the kiln. Now, think about this. The ISO EN 10545 2 and 10 standard, this is a international standard, it actually indicates that Tiles with over 3% moisture absorption can be known to expand as much as 0.6 millimeters per meter in length. That's three quarter inch for every 100 feet. Now, add this to an installation in a commercial kitchen. In a commercial kitchen, we've got lots of water, 
We've got lots of cleaning going on. If we don't have sufficient movement potential in these commercial kitchens, we could actually end up with broken tiles or heaved tiles in our kitchens. And you've probably gone into some of these commercial kitchens and seen areas where the tiles have these long, radius-shaped, curved cracks along a joint or along the edge. And it's kind of a strange-looking crack, but it'll actually go almost corner to corner on one side of the tile. And that's actually an indication of that type of movement. An example of the thermal expansion could be the outside of a building facade. Now, this is an interesting scenario because one of the things that most people don't realize is that the tile and the substrate underneath are being heated at a different rate. You can think of it like basically your tile is being exposed directly to the sun and it's almost like an insulating effect behind it so that the amount of heat that radiates through the tile, through the mortar, through the waterproofing or other systems to the substrate happens slowly. So the substrate's not moving at the same rate as the tile. The coefficient of expansion contraction for those two surfaces may be different. So now we've got differential. Now, take a look at this example. I've got a 92 degree day and the surface of my tile is 140 degrees. How's that possible? Remember that your tiles will expand, contract based on temperature change and that coefficient movement. The solar gain of that tile, you've probably walked up to a car someday uh, during the summer and you put your hand on a black car and feel like you're going to burn it. Anybody who lives in the west or in the southwest probably knows the experience of using uh, hot mitts to drive their cars. That's solar gain. The car is not necessarily the same temperature as the surface is exposed to the sun. The air is different temperature than those surfaces because that solar gain will actually change the temperature. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is actually, this is actually the guidelines. Let's talk a little bit about the history of these guidelines. And we talked about the movement. We talked about what kind of risks are involved. Now, what about what people have been learning about this or what exactly, what guidelines are available? It's believed that the installation practices were learned by experience and passed down as artisans taught the next generation. We know that tile goes back to Greek and Roman times, and there's a lot of examples that have survived until today. There's many in in Italy showing, you know, the Forum as well as even the Pantheon. Now, the Pantheon's kind of a cool one because in the Pantheon, it was finished in about 300 AD. It's actually a bunch of multicolored marble on the floor, and it was said to be installed over a pozzolanic mortar bed sitting on a sand bed and a small gutter was included around the perimeter of this to allow for movement so that it wouldn't push on the walls. Now, this installation, by estimation, is close to 2,000 years old now, and is in pretty good shape for 2,000 years. So movement really seems to work here. Now, moving forward to more present times, installers began to get together and share their experience in more recent times, and we'll say the 1800s, the Tile Council or the Tile Contractors Association of America started, and others like this in the early 19th and 20th century. Believe it or not, there were as many as 2,000 organizations that actually formed trying to improve the quality of tile, trying to share experiences, trying to make tile better. Now, what we're going to discuss in this presentation is actually three that remain till today that are, that are quite influential. You know, the installation methods and materials for tile have changed over the years more than you can really imagine. When the Tile Council of America was formed in 1945, the methods of installation and technology of tile installations was a little different than today. But it was also a little of the same. But an example 
from 1945 is that most tiles were one inch to six inch size tiles and they were porous and absorptant. By 1984, our industry had advanced a little bit more and we were, in, we were still working with the, por with the porous tiles, but our sizes got bigger. We were now eight inch by eight inch and 12 inch by 12 inch. And we were starting to see some of the through body porcelain tiles introduced on the market. Today, things are even crazier than ever before. We've got tile sizes that are commonly seen as 48 inches by 48 inches and larger. And we have a new trend in the GPT tiles, which we call the gauged porcelain tile panels. And these things can be 48 inches by 120 inches or larger. And you'll see in that photograph, that's one tile that the guy is handling there from a, from a lift. That's one tile. And you'll see it spans three cement boards. Now, if you're wondering about how technology changes, you can look at another industry. I included three Jeeps, the 45 Jeep, the 84 Jeep, and the 2019 Jeep. They look kind of the same, right? However, the differences are vast between those, between those different cars. And our industry has changed just as much. Now, the organizations that we're specifically going to focus on in this presentation today are the Tau Council of North America, the NTCA, or the National Tile Contractors Association, who's sponsoring this, by the way, and ANSI, the American National Standards Institute. To start with, the Tile Council of North America was established in 1945 with the sole purpose of expanding the ceramic tile market in the U.S. The Tile Council of North America has been instrumental in the tile industry in developing installation products. It coordinates with manufacturing and installation professionals to publish a handbook for tile installation that actually defines and outlines a series of best practice guidelines for installation of tile and stone. The National Tile Contractors Association was formed around 1947 as the Southern Tile Contractors Association. Today, this association supports the tile industry with education, training, and networking of installation professionals. This group also publishes a reference manual to assist in tile installation professional both plan installations correctly, install with quality, and troubleshoot problems with installation. ANSI, or the American National Standards Institute, publishes the American National Standards Association uh, the standards specification for installation of ceramic tile. That's a mouthful, right? Included in this book are the installation methods and product specifications for installation. And let's just jump right in. Let's take a look at these things. I'm going to start with talking about the NTCA. Now, the NTCA specifically recommends and gives guidelines on movement joints in tile installation. So they call this out in their reference manual. They cover it in three specific points. Now, I'm going to summarize quite a bit on this. The first is the importance of incorporating movement joints to compensate for expansion and contraction of the structure as well as the tiles installed. Now we've talked about structural expansion contraction and we've talked about the tiles. So the national con the the National Tile Contractors Association agrees that this is an issue. A section is also included on what the tile contractor should know, which includes the Tile Council of North America, EJ171, and ANSI A108 are intended not to specify, but to assist in the design of joints for movement. Additionally, it includes how the, design, the installation professional should communicate the need for the movement joints in the installations to their general contractor. So this is specifically to help the contractor do his job and communicate the necessity for these joints so that it does not cause issues in the installation. Now, if you want more detail, I suggest you look at the NTCA 
reference manual in Chapter 2, Substrates Under Movement Joints. When we start talking about the American National Standards Institute, ANSI has a guideline. It's ANSI A108.01 3.7. Now, it's a lot of numbers, but essentially what it is, it gives you an address of where to look for this information. This specific guideline actually goes into specifying how to do the work as well as specifying products. And they talk specifically about movement joints and their necessity. Again, it's written more to the installation professional than it's written to a design professional. The first point that we really get to is that it, it's not the intent of these specifications to make movement joint recommendations for a specific project. Well, we heard that in the last one through the NTCA. It indicates also that the specifier is responsible to specify detailed movement joints and show locations. Then it recommends that openings for movement joints shall extend completely and directly through the tile work down to the structural backing. Now this is a reminder to the design, to the installation professional that he needs to make sure that it doesn't, it's not just something on the surface of the tile, it actually has to go through everything in order to work. The last point in this guideline is actually to reference the TCNA EJ171 that was also referenced in the NTCA. Now if the NTCA and the ANSI reference the, the TCNA EJ171, maybe we should take a look at that one. To start with, the Tau Council of North America has been addressing how to do this for many years. The history is, in 1963, they actually started mentioning the necessity for putting movement joints in installation. Now that was 56 years ago. By 1967, they changed the title of the section to expansion joints. By 1971, they added information specifying the spacing of the expansion joints and what kind of sealant should be used. And then in 1986, the main change was to na rename this guideline to EJ171, which is its, the same name that we use today, 33 years later. So you can see that the movement joints have been recommended for 56 years, and 33 years, EJ171 has been out there. Going into more detail, the EJ171 represents probably the most extensive guideline on how to place the joints in the tile installation. And it's eight pages long now. Now I remember when we first started out, it was a little smaller and uh, I mentioned many of you that maybe have been in the industry and seen this guideline before realized that. The EJ171 guideline begins with two very important statements. The first is that movement joints in the tile installation are essential and required. The second indicates the design professional is responsible to determine the location and design of the movement joints in the tile installation. This is also stated in the NTCA and ANSI documents. Now if you think about this truly, because the design professional is responsible for the structural elements and the aesthetic aspects of the installation, they're going to be the best person to decide where they want those joints. And really, I have, an, I have a phrase that I use frequently when we talk about this, and I'm discussing it with one of our customers who's asking questions about where to put them or how to, how to install them. And what I remind them is, hey, you can put the joint where you want it and have it look nice. Or you can let nature put the joint where it wants and it won't look nice, or, and it won't look like where you wanted it. So this is about, it is again, it's about planning ahead. Getting into a little bit more detail, 
the general guidelines include interior joints, maximum of every 25 feet in each direction, exterior joints, 8 to 12 feet in each direction. When the interior tile work is exposed to direct sunlight or moisture, make sure they're a maximum 12 feet apart. Now, above ground concrete slab substrate, they also suggest that those joints should be 12 feet in each direction. I'm sure some people may not have seen that before, but in an above ground slab, you've got a lot more potential for movement going on. And it also suggests that there should always be a movement joint where the tile work abuts a restraining surface. Now, that includes pipe penetrations, that includes walls, that includes structural elements. It's just to make sure that those are isolated and, and act independently of each other. Now, specifically when we look at our perimeter joints, you can see that an exterior joint, we're saying to use them on inside and outside corners in this guideline. On the interior joint, or in the interiors, they're only requiring them on the inside corners. But you'll note that they include here should continue through the tile work, including expansion, control, construction, cold, saw cut, isolation, and contraction joint, as well as seismic joints. Now, I didn't cover seismic joints in this presentation, but that's another type of joint that the ACI doesn't even address. Remember that the key here is that we're expecting that movement could happen at any one of those joints, so we should have something flexible where that is, and we should not put a rigid surface over that joint and thus possibly have a cracked tile. They also include a notation here that says, if you choose to relocate an expansion joint, which is something we get a lot of questions about, I'd like to move the expansion joint. Well, there are risks in doing so, and we could discuss that for quite a long time. But the truth of the matter is, when you do it, you can't hold the tile contractor responsible for cracking in the grout joints or in the tile over a saw cut or over any other type of joint you try to move. The issue is, is that we expect movement to happen there, and if there's not a flexible material there, it's possible that a rigid material will crack. Now, when we're designing these joints for movement, we also look at how wide the joints should be. If you notice that in this case, for an exterior joint, they're suggesting actually that minimum 3 8 inch wide joint, 8 foot on center, and half inch for 12 foot on center. This is, this is a minimum guideline. And then they suggest beyond that, they say, okay, if the surface tile, the tile of the surface, blah, blah, if the tile surface temperature changes more than 100 degrees between summer high and winter low, for example, 115 degrees temperature change, you're going to add 1 16th of an inch to that minimum joint width. And then at 130 degrees, another 15 degree rise, you're going to add 1 8 inch. So 1 16th more for each 15 degree rise. And then for interior, your perimeter joints at perimeter walls should not be less than one quarter inch wide. And typically we cover those with a trim, a cove base, or shoe molding. So whether we go up against, a, whether we make the joint against the baseboard or we slip it underneath the baseboard, it's, it's well hidden. You're not going to be looking at it. And Believe it or not, your perimeter joints, other than perimeter walls, not less than one quarter inch, but never less than one eighth inch. So the saying always allow this movement to occur. All right, how do we find this information on winter, winter low and summer high? I typically like to use the Weather Service or other reputable climate data site that we can look up summer high and winter low to see what what will need to be done. We suggest you, can use, you consider using the information on the record high and low temperature. Remember that your building is going to be subject to extremes. It's not going to be subjected to the average. And typically it will be designed to the extremes and not to the average. 
we really can't predict what the weather's going to do. Now, if you look in this example, you see we looked up seven cities. Interesting note about these seven cities, you can see Atlanta, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Miami, Dallas, New York, and Chicago. These are big cities, so there's a lot of tile work done in these cities. Did you know that three of these cities have temperature range of less than 100 degrees? It's winter to summer. And then four of the seven have greater than 115 degree, and two have greater than 130 degree temperature swings. You see that, for example, Chicago has an extreme. You would think Chicago kind of a cold climate, right? In Atlanta, Georgia, would you expect that one to be such a temperature extreme? So pay attention to these particular things in designing your joint widths. Now, how we can apply this. Now, I put together a little chart here to kind of help us understand this a little better. So if you look at Chicago, and we say 131 degrees, and typically what I like to do is round up by about 2 degrees, just to give myself, so if I'm at 113 degrees, I would round up to 115. And this is just to make sure that we're covering that extreme. And you'll notice that at 8 foot on center, we're su that what's suggested in the EJ171 is a 1 half inch wide joint. At 12 feet, we're is, is suggested a 5 eighths joint. And you'll see down to New York, Dallas, and you can see the trends all the way across. And this is again to avoid the possibility of issues. When we look at the actual tile, you'll notice the tiles have their own coefficient of expansion and contraction. And what's interesting to note here is if you look at the brackets to the left side, you'll notice that porcelain tile, granite tile, and glass tile all have ranges of expansion and contraction due to linear coefficient of thermal expansion. And you notice that the granite tile has the greatest range of all of them because it's a natural product and has the most variation. Glass tile is the highest, and porcelain tile is typically a little lower. But you'll notice at 8-foot joint centers, 12-foot joint centers, 16, it'll actually give you the joint width in that chart. And this actually is included in the EJ171 guideline. So these type, these type of resources are available to the design professional to really help them understand how to design their joints. <laughs> You didn't think we were going to do math in this one, did you? Well, the equation is just an example of how we applied all that information. So for our joint widths in relation to our coefficient of expansion contraction of our tile, we can actually calculate those numbers on the previous chart. Now, you're probably asking how this is useful to you, but for the design professional, this actually will allow them the flexibility to design exactly where they want the joints placed. The simple plug and play, it's, it's a simple equation where I enter in my desired dimension between joints, my temperature change expressed in degrees Celsius, my coefficient of thermal expansion, you'll see, is 0 .000007, which is a pretty big number if you look at it and then our sealant movement rating, which is 25. So we just plug those, those pieces of information in, and it gives us a 1 quarter inch, roughly, joint width to go with for a 25-foot spacing. Now, if I wanted to make that 20-foot spacing, I would add 20 feet in that calculation. If I wanted to make them 30 feet spacing, I could put that in, but it would not be compliant with the guideline. So what it, the idea here is we're trying to give the design professionals some flexibility. We can see that in the EJ171 that this guideline is actually helping us as installers, us as design professionals, depending on who the audience is, to actually design these joints where we want them and place them, as I said,
place them where they're going to look nice versus where nature places them and they don't look nice. When we talk about the sealants or the, the actual material we put in those expansion joints, there's three types that are commonly used. And we have the urethane, the silicone, and the polysulfite sealants. Now typically the urethanes are used interior, exterior, vertical joints, and horizontal interior joints. They're known for high abrasion resistance, and you're really going to see them most often in building joints where they have those big concrete slabs together or they use them in construction of other heavy-duty structures. The silicone sealants are used interior, exterior, vertical tile surfaces, and horizontal surfaces. Now the silicones can be T-rated or not rated for traffic, so traffic or non-traffic. And we also suggest that you test, you know, as the manufacturer, I know that we should always recommend testing because plasticizers present in some silicones may discolor a natural stone product. The polysulfides are typically a two-component sealant. They're the oldest technology and very, very chemically resistant. Specifically, TCNA AJ171 doesn't talk much about those, and we don't really hear much about it either from our standpoint. Just a little bit more detail on the sealants that are specified, just in case you were wondering. ASTM C920 is the specification. And if you notice, we break the sealants up into different types, grades, classes, and uses. So if I'm looking at the data sheet for the sealant I'm using, it could be an S, which is a single component, an M, multi-component, meaning I have to mix the two. My grades can be either for horizontal surfaces, in the case of it's a P, or an NS for vertical surfaces, non-sagging. When we talk about class, we're talking about the actual amount of elongation. In the case of a 25, that means that I can have a plus or minus 25% increase or decrease in the joint width without compromising the strength of the sealant. When I get to use, when I have a T or an NT, that tells me T being traffic. In other words, I can have people walking over it. I won't be worried about a woman's heel sticking into it and damaging it or someone getting caught in it or NT, meaning that I'm going to use it on walls only. And then the uses M and G will be remain bonded to a mortar or glass surface. Now moving forward, we talk about the preformed joints. Now if you notice, I'm showing the same two preformed joints. One of them on the left is actually a large joint. It's actually a, what I would kind of call a sliding joint. And the application there is very heavy duty. It allows for heavy traffic over the joint, whereas the one on the right is more of a flexible sealant joint. And it just the advantage to that one is it's preformed. I just install it as I'm installing my tile. So it's, it's already in place. So when I go to grout, I don't have to add anything extra. I don't have to come back and caulk it or anything like that. And it's very, very consistent looking. So there's advantages and disadvantages here. Finally, when we look at the last parts of the EJ171, there's a series of architectural section details that help us graphically understand how these joints are assembled. Now, what I want you to see here, and I want you to look carefully, and I want you to see that the joint is always referenced as a two-to-one ratio. In other words, if you look at the one, the EJ171-18, uh, you'll notice it's way up in the right corner. You'll notice that the actual sealant sits over the top of a compressible backup rod. We call those backer rods. Essentially, the idea is to minimize the issue of a three-sided bonding. See, the sealant won't perform if it's bonded to three sides. It'll actually tear under the same conditions that if it were installed with a two-sided bond, meaning it's bonded only to the tile edges. Additionally, if you have a two-to-one ratio, it'll 
expand or sh it'll stretch a little bit better or be compressed better without any damage. And you notice that we've got different designs here. We've got an isolation expansion joint. We've got another one over a cleavage system with a mud bed. And you can see each one of these details show us how to apply this particular joint type. If we move forward and take a look at a few more, you can see that I've got a bonded and unbonded mortar bed system. And this actually shows me how to detail both. And you notice that everything is specified in the layering system. Moving on to the next one, you'll see that we've got a saw cut control joint on the left. And you can see how we addressed it. We stuffed the backer rod down in the saw cut, and then we put our joint directly over the top. And you notice that when I've got a mortar bed in place, I do the same thing, but my backer rod is sitting right below the sealant. It's not sitting down inside the crack down in the bottom part. Now moving forward, I want you to see on the left here, you'll see that the G detail is actually the perimeter joint detail. And you'll see the perimeter joint's a thin bed application. And you can see that they're using a bond breaker tape on the bottom. Now the bond breaker tape can be anything that'll break the bond between the surface. So we don't have that three-sided bond we discussed. So I mean, that could be anything from a piece of pinstriping that you buy at an auto parts store, or it could be a specifically a bond breaker tape that you could buy through a concrete supply house or through your tile distributor. You'll notice that the perimeter joint with a mud bed is the same. We have a two-sided joint. We've stuffed the backer rod down inside where we had the space. And then we're showing the 171J again, showing where the perimeter joints should be located, sealing the wall joints and the floor joints. And again, remember the perimeter joint is probably the most neglected one of all. I, I cannot tell you how many installations I've walked out on and with tented tiles where they had zero perimeter joints on the installation. No room for movement whatsoever. Moving forward, there's also a need for a generic movement joint. Sometimes there's no joint in the slab whatsoever. And really, we still need the joint in the tile work, so we need to detail that joint. So what this is showing is actually if I need to put a joint somewhere in the tile installation, but I don't have a joint in the slab that is corresponding with that joint, I can easily use a generic one by using a bond breaker tape and putting my sealant in place, or using the preformed joint material like we showed before. And this is kind of to remind us that even if I've got a wood type structure, there's details for the wood type structures that, remember, our backer board joints, uh, in this case you're showing, the one on the left is a little confusing because you're looking at it from the top of the wall. This is actually a wall installation. That's why you're not seeing an underlayment here. These are two wall installation details. So while we were looking at floors, this is actually a wall detail, and we're showing one where we're actually putting our generic joint in the wall. And remember that the backer board joint should be taped and treated per the manufacturer of the backer board. So in other words, we would not anticipate that movement would happen there. However, we would still need to put our expansion joint with a generic joint. On the, on the right side, you're noticing you have the K, the 171K, and that's actually a joint between two structural elements. And it's showing how to detail that again using the backer rod. So I want to recap a little bit as we're talking about all of these things, we've talked about a ton of information. But what have we really learned? You know, have we learned that we really need expansion joints in tile or stone installation? I hope you say yes to this question after listening to this information. What happens when you don't allow for the movement in the tile installations? 
Well, as you can see from the photographs we showed, that it could result in some tented or delaminated tiles. And the types of joints in concrete, and what function do they serve? You can see that you can have cut joints, you can have expansion, cold, construction, seismic, or other types of joints in your surface. And you need to address them because there will be movement at that surface. And then we've seen that there are guidelines that apply, and these guidelines have been in place for 56 years specifically, and the EJ171 that we were just speaking about, 33 years. Amazing that we've made these recommendations. And there's basic rules of thumb, as well as we have specific detailed ways of figuring out where we want to put those joints. Because one of the arguments that we get often is that when we're placing the joints, they say, oh, I, I can't put it there because of my tile pattern. This allows us to actually design where that joint is going. And it also says, remember, that the, that the tile installation professional, while he's consulting his general contractor and his design professional, he's also supposed to be encouraging them to place them and to show him where they should be. Because the importance of the aesthetics should be included as well as the design or engineering side of the building. I hope you found that this presentation was helpful today. And I appreciate your attention. Mike, this fantastic is, yes, presentation. Sir. Yeah, great job. You uh, gave our uh, attendees a lot of information. And uh, 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 I actually have had a few emails already saying what a great presentation it is. And uh, a lot of people are asking for the archive version. Um, I have a question for you from our, one of our attendees. Um, where do design professionals attend school to develop competence in specifying movement joints in complex buildings where concrete shrinkage and structural movements are considered? That was a well, mouthful. Believe it or not, uh, that, that's, a, that's an excellent question because when we talk about these things, specifically most people when they're educated in their engineering side or in the architectural side, and I've worked with quite a few engineers and architects, they are specifically taught material science, expansion, contraction of materials, and how the building is going to react to specific movements, not just expansion, contraction, but wind loads, seismic loads, uh, cyclic loads, and other things that they have to design into the structure. Where we have to be as the tile professionals is we have to point them to the EJ171. We have to point them to the NTCA, point them to ANSI, so that they see that specifically the tile industry has actually designed this for them, and they just need to apply some simple guidelines in order to have a successful installation. So. So his question was design professionals, so I'm thinking architects, designers. Um, do we need to start working closer with their educational schools, their uh, training, to try and keep them up to date with what, uh, what our industry is doing? That's an excellent question, and, and this presentation was actually made specifically for that purpose. Our architectural, yeah. uh, our MAPE's architectural group is actually out presenting this. Matter of fact, I, one of my architectural reps from MAPE called me this morning. He said he was presenting it to an architectural group today. So we're, actually, we're actively out presenting these things, and the architects actually receive continue, continuing education credits by uh, attending these classes. So they're very so what I to take them. Sure. So what I recommend then for, for all of you design and architectural professionals is to contact your manufacturers, uh, the manufacturers, uh, usually setting materials in our, um, in our industry, and seeing if uh, the local rep could uh, come and give a, a presentation on uh, uh, this or, or something similar. 
that would probably be the easiest to get to everyone is contacting local, you know, um, excuse me for mentioning this during your presentation, but like MAPE, Custom Building Products, Ardex, Laticrete, uh, you know, you can go on and on, but contact them and uh, see if their local uh, salesperson or technician can uh, come and give a presentation. Right, right, Mike? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's essentially, that's the service that our company provides to the design professional and to the industry is we, we, we feel very strongly that education is the key to success. And uh, honestly, we want our customers to be successful first. Great. I will mention one more place, Mike, one more place where they can go. Um, they can go to the NTCA's website and um, they should be able to look up our NTCA five-star contractors who can also give a presentation like this to local architects and designers. So, well, that's the only questions we, oh, go ahead, Mike, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to apologize. I just noticed that I didn't include in my reference material in the NTCA. I'm going to have to edit that. <laughs> I apologize for that. <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. Um, NTCA website's very simple. It's tile-assn.com. And you can go right on there and you can uh, find your five-star, uh, local five-star contractor who can give a, a nice presentation also. So I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, Mike, that, were all, that was all the questions we have. So what it means is uh, you were very thorough, did a great job of explaining. Um, I, I can't believe how many emails I'm getting saying what a great webinar it was. So fantastic job. Uh, again, thanks. Thank you attendees for being here. Um, we will Thank have you. another uh, webinar coming up soon. You'll be invited to, and um, we will talk to you then. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you.